Welcome everyone. I'm Steve Cog and I'm the president of Mecklenburg Audubon. I'd like to welcome you all to the September meeting of Mecklenburg Audubon Society, both people in the room and on Zoom. And I'd like to welcome new members. The new member list is just amazingly long. So I'm just going to call out a few. Uh, Brio, Jessica, Bill, Amber, Alex, Russ, Alyssa, and everyone else, welcome. Glad you're here. If you'd like to join, please see Janet or Sharon beside tables, and you can pay your dues. Membership is $10 a year for one person and $15 for a whole family. Or you could join on the web page where you click on the little thing at the top that says join. Okay, uh, just a little bit of news of some of the things that's been going on with Mecklenburg Audubon. Last spring we helped set up a landscape and chimney sweep tower at Winterfield Elementary School in East Charlotte. Uh, this coming February and March we are hosting an exhibit of the winners of the Audubon Photo Conference going to have 10 winners and honorable mentions. We have them for about a month and we're going to set up several chances for people to see them. I think the March meeting, we'll have the pictures set up in the street, we can see them, and we're going to have them at several other locations around Mecklenburg County. Uh, and Chris Bowling, I think you would like to make an announcement. Thank you, everybody. Um, I am actually speaking for myself and also Manisha Desai. She could not be here today. Um, we are actually forming an equity, diversity, and inclusion committee. Um, we do have training and support from the state Audubon, and we will be doing some online training this fall. But we're asking if anybody is interested in the membership to please reach out to us. Um, you can sign up. There's a pad on your table. This will be coming around the room. Yeah. Um, for anybody who wants to, who is interested, um, and for everybody in Zoom, if you want to just send an email to the contact um, and, and um, let us know that if you're interested in joining or getting more information, please let us know. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And also on that same pad is an opportunity to sign up if you're interested in the Lights Out initiative. Uh, a number of cities in North Carolina and across the country have adopted Lights Out to turn on off lights in big buildings when birds are migrating because there are a lot of birds lost from building collisions. And uh, we've been having some trouble getting traction on this in uh, Charlotte, although the city of Matthews has recently passed a resolution for lights out. So we're making some progress. But if you would like to get involved in some advocacy work, that's an opportunity. So that's all in that same yellow pants coming in. Okay, Richard Hocat, our field trip coordinator, will tell us about some upcoming I'll try to speak up, uh, We have a lot of opportunities coming up. Those of you that are new members, please come to some of our walks. Look at the calendar or look at the section that says bird walks or look at the mailing that goes out at six o'clock on Sunday nights and see what's available for that week and look further ahead too because some of these are already filling up. I know in uh, the Jackson Park group that John Park's doing, I just got a message that that's full, but the waiting list is still on hold. And there are some beginner walks. So, you know, if it's been a while since you've been out or if you haven't been out and you want to know about it, that's kind of a good way to start with a little bit smaller group. We work limiting walks to 12. We're varying that. The beginner walks are actually going to be probably smaller. Some of the venues we can have more than one. So just don't, don't, don't remember too much. Contact that particular leader and let them know that you're interested in doing that. And we'll get a communication channel set up in case something changes. Uh, and also in the last couple of panels put a link to our etiquette. Look at that too. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing to learn how to stay together as a group. Spend too much time on Facebook, all those things that make the experience a good one. But we've got a pretty 
school calendar in September and October, weekdays and weekends both. Oh, if you didn't sign in when you came to the door, we have a sign in sheet and we need to fill that out for using this facility. If you haven't done that, please take that opportunity. Make sure anything else we should discuss. Okay, then Sharon will. Oh. Yeah, you want to do that now? She's Janet Palmer. She's our hospitality chair. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay. This is really easy. A lot of refreshments next month and the month after. Things to drink, things to eat. Please sign in. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Janet. Okay, now I think Sharon is going to introduce the speaker to you. I'm not sure I have a list of exactly who's speaking, but is um, that good? So, uh, so the main attraction tonight is um, the trip to Panama that um, some of our members took um, June 15th through the 23rd. 15 people, and most of those people I think are in here. And two of them are going to tell us about that experience. And I think I can shoot the slideshow. And our own Richard Pappat is going to lead the discussion. Yeah, we did it at the beginning. Unless you want to go through them again. I mean, we can. There were a lot of people in one of them. So these Wait a minute, we're not yet. Not yet. <laughs> yes. Oh, there you are. I see. I gotta get there. These are you're going to have to talk fast. <laughs> <laughs> It's still on the loop. You get to see what they are. They're everybody who didn't see them before. So then Richard forgot. Richard forgot. That's one of the today is the reason why we create trust with my country, I believe. Because I saw it for the first time in one of my bean yards this year, and Steve Jenkins took another nice picture of the great trust with Michael. So there's a camera that I do on. Uh, and did you see that um, lesson? Um, so I read about those that, um, that was in the backyard, I think, that they're not rare, but they're rare to see, and they only did them for me. It's not very interesting. I thought it was worth it being on our bird slideshow since it was in the room. There is another one from Steve Cobb. Um, a pair of groceries. Not for the green worm, we're just outside it. Red Star and the Great Hunt. Betty? Betty here? Betty's online. Uh, so these are like the worm, right, Steve? Yes. Well, this is what I wanted to show up on the left there. I had a shadow on here. Isn't that beautiful? So those are nice pictures. Okay. Do you want to add anything? Sure, they do them justice, but I tried. <laughs> um, oh, so uh, uh, the Panama trip, Richard 
Kat and I'm Steve and Diane and maybe Judy. So uh, June 15th to the 23rd, we went to is that right? mm -hmm. went to Panama. We flew to Panama City. Uh, some of us had a little bit of a walking trip up on American Airlines, and some of us had a little walking trip going back on Delta Airlines, but it all kind of evened out. Just got there on time, and I think everybody just had a uh, the first time I think this Michelberg Autobahn's ever done an international. Burning trip. And so uh, I thought we'd start out because Diane had an interest in telling us something about the geology and the geography of the area, which was quite interesting. Panama is really quite an interesting place. Okay. I don't do this a lot, so bear with me. Speak up. Okay, Mecklenburg Audubon Society decided to travel to Panama for its first international birding trip, and Panama was a great choice for several reasons. I'm going to do the first. Well, you have you have it in your hand. Oh, this will this will do it. Okay. All right. most country in Central America. Uh, for us, a good reason to go to Panama was that it was not a terribly long trip to get there from North Carolina. Another good reason for us to go to Panama was that it was a totally different climate from North Carolina and allowed us to see a whole new world of birds and mammals and reptiles. Ah, okay. Now, you can see, <laughs> if, if I stop going through so quickly, now, see? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Panama is located right here. It's between Costa Rica and Colombia. Geologically, Panama is a pretty young country. About 10 million years ago, this area of land that involves Costa Rica and Panama collided with the South American continent and formed this land bridge, which now connects North and South America. And because of this activity, there are mountains found in this area of Panama and Costa Rica. Let me do this. And uh, most of the rocks that you find on the terrain of Panama are igneous rocks because it's volcanic. Okay, the first place we stayed in Panama was located close to Panama City. The first place we stayed was called the Canopy Tower, and it was just about a 30 minute drive north of Panama City, which is located here, and east of the Panama Canal. Okay, the Panama Canal is located in this area right here. And so from the Canopy Tower, we were able to see the Panama Canal, as well as many birds that are found in the Canopy canopy area of the tropical rainforest. Okay, Panama has an east-west orientation and is located approximately at nine degrees latitude. At this distance from the equator, Panama has a tropical climate and rainy and dry seasons as opposed to winter and summer. 
The wet season is from May wait, until wait. November, and the dry season is from December to day April. In, day in. Is the slide you want me on? Yeah, this is okay. Okay. The first place we stayed was the, the Canopy Tower, which is just north of Panama City and east of the Panama Canal, which is located here. Okay. The other place we stayed was the Canopy Lodge, and this is located approximately a two a two hour drive from Panama City and is actually located in an area that is volcanic. There is a volcano there and the lodge was located on the edge of the caldera. The Canopy Tower is in the Sobrania National Park and is in many tropical countries. The rainforest was cut down for farming and other activities for many years, but the rainforest around the Panama Canal was not damaged, mostly because the United States had control of the land surrounding the canal. The tower is located. Let me do it. Okay. The tower is located at an altitude of about 400 feet. And in June, it averages about 11 inches of rainfall. Okay. No, that's it. The lodge, which is the other point, is located on the edge of this volcano. It's at an altitude of about 2,000 feet and averages about eight and a half inches of rain in the month of June. Okay, these two locations offer various habitats and enabled the group to see 231 species of birds, along with many interesting mammals, insects, and reptiles. Okay, and now Richard Pocat is gonna tell you about the places we stayed and the wonderful group of birders that participated in this trip with him. So this is a picture of the Canopy Tower. This was built as a radar tower by the US military. And in 1995, the U.S. Uh, gave up the tower, and the Panamanian government was able to, to take it over, and they were able to uh, find a, the entrepreneur who <coughs> purchased it and turned it into an echo lodge, primarily focused on birding. Uh, and so at the top of a hill, that's why I said 400 feet, because the canal is pretty close to sea level, uh, and the hill is overlooking the Panama Canal. Now, so when we got up in the morning, we'd get up where that yellow radar dome is and go along the edges of that and uh, have really nice views both down on the canopy right immediately at our feet and also down at the ocean and looking at ships that were getting ready to enter the canal, which is some of the canals. Uh, they have uh, put 12 guest rooms in. I wouldn't say they're decent, it's clean and neat. The housekeeping was very good. I have to say the people there were just, we had good food. They were able to accommodate a couple of special diets, which we thought was special. Because the uh, tower wasn't totally full, there were a couple of other guests besides our group. So we had to meet a couple of new friends, one from Madrid, a couple of ladies from South Dakota. And, uh, we had bedrooms on the first the lower floors and then on the top floor was the dining area and in the uh, evening time that's what we do for dinner and also to go through our checklist of all the different species of animals we had seen that day our days a lot of times would start on the very top on the observation deck when they come out the windows we'd have about uh, i just got to smile when i think about it we had about an hour and a half time as slowly things started to come to life and you started hearing the sounds and it's just going to be as today so we have our cars and chickens and new jays and new jays here. 
It actually, uh, there's a still barbed wire fence around it and a big sign that says you have to have a U.S. military ID. <laughs> yeah, you can go to the next. And then when we went to the Canopy Lodge, it was a kind of a different experience in terms of the, um, not in terms of the service. The service was still excellent, yeah. But we had huge rooms instead of little rooms in the tower. And uh, it was really quite a nice lodge. This area that we're looking at in this picture is actually uh, outdoors, but covered. Six fifty. Very well covered. That's what, just behind uh, is where we sat and had dinner. It's very comfortable rooms. Uh, it was rainy there, like she said, eight to eleven inches, and it rained sometimes all night, and it rained sometimes when we were having siesta in the afternoon. And we hardly got rain on the we thought we were going into green season. Yeah, we were river running through the property quite a bit. Yeah, these are our guides, Alex and Anila. Fantastic. Amazing ears, amazing eyes. And of course, they have a, a network in the canopy family because they also have. Camp. And so they have probably a half a dozen guys who are out scouting around all the time. So they, they know where a lot of the birds oh. hang out, habitats are. So that helps. But they also are quite talented too, which I think is and very personal and very, very helpful. And there we are, and Carol called it uh, the chain gang. I think. <laughs> They, they would load all the gringos up in the back of the truck and we would take off. This was from in the tower. We had a van. We had vans. Just over there, rain. I think that's the slide. Oh, yeah. So that's, this is looking down from the tower. You can see one of the container ships going through. I kind of expected that to be sort of more of a chain of one ship after another. It was sort of every 15 or 20 minutes. Later on, Ron is going to talk a little bit more about the plan because they got to learn a little bit about the plan. And then down at the bottom, we get together up in the library area and then we went up more to the tower and went to our checklists. Steve's going to cover that. Animals, we saw the size of birds. I mean, we were focusing on birds, but it's amazing how many other species we would see. Be glad. There were about a thousand species of birds recorded. That was one of the reasons we went. But I was really surprised after making many trips to the tropics about how many animals we got to see. Yeah. Speak up. Speak this way. Speak this way. Speak to the. But I have to look at this one. <laughs> one day we were riding in the back of that bus, on the back of that truck you saw up with the seats. And right next to the road, there were these four baby armadillos. Mm -hmm. They were maybe a quarter of the size of a regular armadillo. And you can see that the pictures are kind of pink. Their, their armor coating hadn't completely formed. And the fact that there are four of them is really important because armadillos, when they have babies, always have identical quadruples. One fertilized egg divides into four embryos. And so those, I'm sure, are all the offspring from one brood of armadillos. And uh, shortly, a little further down the road from the armadillos, we saw this anteater, a northern tomando, crossing the road in front of us. And in the tropics maybe eight or nine times. And this is the first time I've ever seen one. I was just astonished that it ran across the road in front of one. Next slide, please. We saw sloths every day. There are two species of sloths in Canada. The Hoffman's two-toed sloth. And they're nocturnal. And we see them in the daytime sometimes, but they're just brown blobs. They weren't real active. But these brown-throated three-toed sloths are diurnal and 
we saw them every day doing something. The picture on the left is right outside the window of the canopy tower where we ate dinner. It's sitting there in the tree. And the one on the left is a male. You can tell it's a male because it's got that yellow patch with a black line down the middle of its back. It was just up in that tree looking at us in the tower. The one on the right is a female, and she doesn't have that yellow patch, so we could sex the sloths as we ran across them. Next, please. We saw one crossing a road one day. This is our last evening in Canada. And Judy's got this video that she's going to run. So you're going to be able to see a sloth running across the road. Look fast. <laughs> Yeah, that's actual speed. <laughs> you can see that sloths sometimes cross roads, and so sloths get hit sometimes. A couple years ago, in Costa Rica, Diane went to a sloth hospital. I saw a baby sloths that were rearing because their mother got killed crossing the road. And, uh, they have different classes of sloths where they have kindergarten, first grade, and second grade. And they let them climb around and they get released back in the water. So you can see why their stamens are in danger crossing any kind of road. Okay, next slide, please. We had lots of primates in Canada. This is right outside the Canopy Tower. And these are little monkeys, maybe the bodies were maybe this big, called Jeffrey's Tantrums. And they would come up and the staff had this little clothesline with a pulley on it. And they tie a banana to the clothesline and they run it out to a tree and then creatures would come and eat it. And these little tamandus would come and fight with each other, make lots of noise, fight it with a banana. It was quite a show. Next, please. Probably the most impressive primate we saw was the mantle power. These are big ones. This big. And they mostly black wool. Brown mantle on the back. And howler monkeys are called howler monkeys because they make this tremendous noise. Uh, you can hear them from miles away. I heard somebody comment, like, said they're like the world's biggest jaguar, mm -hmm. but it's coming out of this prime. Okay, next please. Uh, some more primates. We went to uh, it used to be a property of the Canal Zone. The American people in the Canal Zone lived there. Now it's turned into an eco-resort. And running across the road in this eco-resort was a whole troop of white-faced capuchin monkeys. These are what used to be the organ grinder monkeys. And this was the next to last one that ran across the road. I've got my camera. <laughs> got a, a blurry picture. But probably the most interesting prime thing we saw is this one at the bottom. A western night monkey. And night monkeys only come out at night. And so that's the banana that the kitchen staff ran out there on the clothesline. And these two night monkeys are eating that banana. And look at the size of the eyes of these things. They're nocturnal, so they've got these big eyes to collect as much light as they can. Okay, next. Some rodents. We saw some squirrels, but the most impressive road is this one. These these are very common. Uh, edges of woods and fields, and we're in a botanical garden here, and so they're really easy to see. And this is a rodent that's like this big. Very impressive. But not much, much of a tail. See that little tiny tail's got a unlike our squirrels. Okay, next. Speaking of rodents, up there in the upper left is a Ruthus tree rat. And it's bigger than a typical rat. It might be this big. And an interesting thing about this is they've never been captured on the ground. There's no record of them being trapped on the ground. They're strictly arboreal. This one was, uh, they're usually nocturnal too. So this one's sticking his head out of the hole in the tree trunk, shining its beady eye on us to see what we're doing walking over this tree. And the one on the right, is related to the raccoons as a kingajee. 
it's also up in that tree where the banana seems like on the kitchen on the string. So we had lots of interesting mammals show up tonight right outside our room. Next, please. We're going to talk a little bit about insects, too. I said there are a thousand species of birds and animals. There are probably 20,000 species of insects. Okay. And so we just concentrated on the big, conspicuous, brightly colored ones. But there's so much insect life and so much that we couldn't even see when we were there. This is a page of beetles. And that top left one is a little evil. It doesn't have a common name, so it's a type of exothalamus. Jekyllianzis. Uh, that weevil was walking along the metal wire that's the edge of the canopy tower platform. So we go out there at sunrise, and sometimes birds would perch on that wire. But in this case, this little weevil was one. The one to the right on that yellow background is a flat faced long horned beetle. You can see why I've got that name. It's got those giant antennae. That yellow background was a house, a, a gatehouse for entering into a reserve. And the one on the bottom was the most impressive uh, beetle we saw. It's a weevil called Clocus syncus. And it was probably this big, but it's just an amazing creature. Look at that snout. See how long that snout is? It's got those black eyes on the head, this big old snout. But halfway down the snout, the antennae are coming out. It's just a marvelous thing. Okay, next. On the left, there are these iridescent blue warrior wasps. And they have this nest they built on the trunk of a tree. That, that brown corrugated looking thing is paper made by the wasp, and they nest in there. And they're called warrior wasps because their sting is especially painful. We were lucky enough not to experience that part of the insect life. And the one on the right, is the world's largest damsel. This big old blue, white, and black thing came flapping through the trees. And the common name for these things is helicopter damselflies, because it looked like a helicopter. The two wings were beating separate from each other. It looked like a helicopter fluttering up. It landed, pulled up its wings. And it was, probably had a wingspan like this. It was an extremely large damsel. Okay, next. We also had insects come visit while we were inside the tower. Uh, on the left, there's a blue cicada, and they're maybe a little bit bigger than the cicadas we have around here. And like the cicadas we have around here, they're up in the trees and they're buzzing. You can hear them. And lots of times when we'd see birds, we saw a number of birds that had caught cicadas and were eating them. So they're very important food. And the one on the right, is the Peruvian shield mantis. And it's about the size of our big training mantis, maybe a little bigger, this big. But it's got that shield on its head and thorax there. And that was walking on the glass of the dining room up on the top part of the town. Okay, next. Uh, while not as impressive looking as some of these other insects, the ants play a major role in the ecosystem of tropics. These ants, leaf cutter ants, we saw everywhere. Leaf cutter ants make trails. So if there's a lawn like at that botanical garden, there's bare dirt where these ants are walking. And they go out into the fields, they go out into the forest, they cut off pieces of leaves, maybe that big, and they carry them back to their underground nest. And in the nest, they chew up the leaves and inoculate with a fungus. And they're not eating the plants, they're eating the fungus growing on And so this is considered to be agriculture. So ants and people have agriculture. There's a little video. Diane took the part of this and Richard took this last part. I'd like this ant my view of the ant action. <coughs> Okay, next. Um, I think the most brilliant of the insects we saw had to have been the butterflies. And we saw many, many butterflies. This uh, polyhema uh, tiger wing is very common. On the right, it's perched on a plant 
It's called hot lips, the flower of the fire. You look have a pest. Flower is really the middle part. Okay, next. Banded peacock, and last wing, these last wings lack scales on major parts of the wing, so you can kind of look through the wing and see what's up on the next. The one at the top, the pointed sister. The guy said, there's a pointed sister. I thought you were saying pointer sister. You know, that <laughs> sold me. But it's not pointer sister, it's the pointed sister. So, okay, it's a pointed sister. I wrote it down, and there's a picture of it. But I didn't figure out later until what the sister part was about. There's a whole group of butterflies, and we have some out west called sisters, and they're called sisters because their coloration is thought to resemble the habit of nuns. So they've got dark brown with white on it. That's a pointed sister. And the one on the bottom, it doesn't have a common name. The scientific name is Hades Noctula, which is a fantastic name. This is a tiny little butterfly. It's black, it's got these white lines in the wings, it's got this big yellow patch. And every picture I've ever seen of one of these, it's perched on the bottom of the wing. It's hanging the butterfly blue. Next. All these are skippers. We have a lot of skippers around here. In fact, the one on the top left is a long tail skipper, and they will show up in your gardens. They're a big skipper. They have tails on the backs of the wings. Their body is kind of fuzzy. Their body is blue. But these other two things are called flashers. They're really skippers. Uh, the two-barred flasher there has got two white bars on the wings. You can see the body is blue. And the one on the upper right is called a small spotted flasher. It's got tiny white spots on it, and also has this iridescent. The owl butterfly with varying things is a large butterfly. It, it's this big. It's got these eye spots that look like the eyes of, guess what? And to the right is what we call a red post and the color's kind of washed out with the horizontal bar on the top of the wing of that butterfly is orange. It's got some red spots down there. But the winner of the butterfly contest were the blue morphos. This one was the Menelaus blue morpho. And you can see the lower part of the wing looks very much like that owl butterfly. It's brown, it's got these eye spots on it. But look there at the top and down there at the bottom. When the wings open, it's iridescent dazzling flashing. And the next slide has got a short video of a more public one. This was perched on the ground. It's probably collecting minerals from the soil to rainforest so it's been wet. So it's on the ground, just opening and closing its wings. And then it's got kind of a erratic flight. And I think that's called for mammals. Yes. So Judy's up next. She, she uh, got it at the last minute. We put in this because we also saw amphibians. And then we saw birds. Yeah, we had to put these guys in. Um, we did see a number of frogs. This one on the um, far left, the leaf litter uh, toad. This thing, we saw several different versions of this and it, whatever, whenever we saw it, uh, I remember saying to Alex, oh, we have a toad over here. And he said, oh, that's the leaf litter. Uh, oh, we got a toad, oh, that's the leaf litter. And they look different because they match the leaf litter. And the, except the only consistent thing was that black, that was lying down the center. But this one happens to be pretty dark, but some of them were light. Some of them were kind of a little more modeled. <laughs> uh, really, really kind of fun. The um, I'm not sure where Charlene saw the. I never did see the. Um, uh, it was a dark frog. Uh, but was it down the front at, at the uh, lodge or at the tower? Is that the botanical garden, maybe? Anyway, but that's. 
That's one of the, uh, the poison dog frogs. Um, the top one is a harlequin, and this guy was really funny because he was first seen on the bumper of a, 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 a jeep, okay? And then he decided he's now on, this is actually on somebody's shoulder. Um, he was just hopping around, but it's, uh, it's really, and he, both, both these are pretty good sized frogs about that big. Um, and then there were also obviously reptiles. We had the, uh, Green iguana didn't show up quite as well there, but we had you know, those guys. Some of those were pretty big. We saw a number of those. Um, the basilisk, for those of you who are Harry Potter people, that's your, there's a common basilisk. Um, the other two are just uh, lizards. This, um, the one, the yellow headed big gecko, which actually lived under the door frame of the tower. He was there quite often. Uh, but there, you know, we saw these guys hurrying around and it's so much fun. All right, so to the birds, of course, which is why we went down. And of course, the big one, the hummingbirds, right? There are 59 species of hummingbirds in, in uh, Panama, and we saw 15 of them. Right? Uh, I should say overall, we saw, what was it, uh, 220 some birds, uh, 261, okay, um, that's probably right, <clears throat> 261, and I, the, the neat thing about the time that we went, we went, because we went in June, uh, sure, we had, pro we might have had pro more problems with rain, but we had a rain god with us who kept it away, uh, Alex, I don't know how he did it, we never really got rained on, <laughs> and it was amazing, uh, but because it was June, all of the, what we call now, our neotropic birds, meaning all our warblers, our canningers, and all, they are up here. So of those 260 some birds, 250 of them were basically Panama birds. Uh, we had been there in March, uh, in fact, some other friends of ours were down there in March and they had over 300 birds, but 100 of them or so were actually birds that we see here in the spring and summer. Uh, so there are birds, right, of course. So these are all Panama birds uh, and definitely uh, life birds. I think we saw a cattle egret, we saw a gray egret, we had turkey vultures and black vultures and swallowtail pike, I think there. Oh, I, the house rent, house rent is in there. <laughs> uh, probably this is Bill and Laura's, um, Favorite bird is the pet. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that, Bill? Where are you? Where? Yep, 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 yep. It's beautiful. What she's saying is that the, the body of the bird was just like a tiny little marble. That's it. That was the uh, The snowy uh, belly. Uh, Snow belly is a snowy belly hummingbird, is another small one that's really quite unusual. It's a little bit hard to see the, the crown of wood nymph, uh, and wood nymphs always kind of remind me of little uh, seahorses in the air. I mean, they, the way they move around. Uh, he's really dark blue, it's a little bit hard to see uh, on this one. Uh, a couple more, one that we saw a lot of, it was pretty easy to see. Oh, yes. Oh. This is the cocaine. He's, 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 she's just, just spectacular. Uh, then the hermit, we had a couple of hermits. Um, but this is the, the, this is the striped hermit, probably the one we saw the most of. Uh, this is pretty good size. Uh, probably about this, this big, the body is about this big, and then you can see that the, the bill itself is really quite large. Um, the white jacobin uh, is another large hummingbird, along um, with that, and then I need to say this, so I can see them. <laughs> Excuse me. Out of the way. There we go. Some, I hope. Okay, the violet belly. 
part about that. Um, the violet bellet. This is one of the smaller ones. Uh, it's interesting with hummingbirds. Um, there's a set called micro hummingbirds. Uh, actually, our ruby throat is part of the micro uh, hummingbirds, and so is that little um, violet bellet. And the other interesting thing you should see here, um, there were most of, the, most of the hummingbirds down there are not called hummingbirds. They're either wood nymphs or they're hermits or they're jacobins or they're uh, coquettes. Uh, kinds of, uh, a few of them are called hummingbirds. That's, uh, sorry. Um, another set. Uh, there's the other green hermit, which is another big bird. This is the one that was making all the noise. This was... Yes, yeah. This is this guy was sitting in, in the in the bushes making a lot of noise, <laughs> just chattering away at us. Uh, and it's the female on that one. The uh, blue chested was probably the most common one we had at the. Uh, at the tower. I mean, they just put on a show for us there. One, there was one in particular uh, had his perch, and I think we all have pictures of this bird sitting on this perch looking at us and you know, just kind of showing off as much as she can. Um, and then the little uh, uh, Rufus tail hummingbird down in the far right um, is actually one that's pretty common up and down. Uh, all of uh, Central South America, South America. Another one of the microbes. Okay, so we know there are a lot of hummingbirds down there. Well, no, I didn't. I was going to bring. I was going to bring the, the book, uh, the uh, Costa Rica book, uh, is about this thing, right? And of that Costa, of that book. I would say half, but a lot of it, a good, a third of it is probably flycatchers. The other third is tanagers. There's lots and lots of tanagers, and we did see quite a few of them. Uh, probably the, I think the most spectacular that we had was the crimson bat um, tanager. We saw that mostly at the lodge, uh, and what was really cool is if, if you. In the dark, I don't want to say the dark, in the in the shadows, you saw the it's hard to see here, but that bill, oops, sorry. Um the bill, there we go, up here, um, just shines. It's silvery. It's really, really cool. Uh, the uh, this guy down here, the palm tanager, actually bred at the tower, uh, and every morning would be sitting. This is the wires at the tower. Uh, be sitting out there, and you kind of had to dodge them as they went out. They really come around there, and they were all over the, the tower early morning, or in the early morning. Not spectacular looking. You know, some of them are pretty spectacular. Like the other three, the palm is pretty pretty dull. Uh, there's another one. I don't think any. Did you get a picture of the blue gray tanager? Yes, one in there. The blue gray is uh, also kind of a duller, but pretty blue, but it's very common. And there's the plain color tanager, which is pretty plain, uh, dusky face. Uh, the um, white shoulder, I mean, they're just easy to go on. If you go to any, if you even go further south, South America, Ecuador, there's even more. Tanagers, um, just everywhere, and all different sizes, different shapes. Comments from Tina Jeremy was Dave's favorite. Okay, bye. Parrots. We heard a lot of parrots. We saw a lot of parrots fly over, um, but we had a hard time actually seeing them in the in the uh, trees and stuff. Um, the red lord parrot. Uh, it was probably one of the more common. Uh, the orange chin was a small, uh, small parakeet, which we had at the amber, uh, amber eye or amber. We 
you know, if you're birders, you go to really weird places. And one of the places we went was ammo dump, which is an old ammo uh, arsenal, I guess it was, where along uh, there was a, a really nice um, swamp or uh, wetland there. Uh, the blue headed, we heard a lot, we saw a lot. Steve got a picture of it. Uh, there were Probably the stars I, I would see. We all love woodpeckers. They were so cool. Uh, most of these are good sized woodpeckers. I mean, the um, delineated is the size of our um, uh, ciliated, pileated, I would say it. Uh, the, the black cheese uh, is really, uh, I mean, it's stunning. This picture doesn't need to do it. And the cinnamon. Just absolutely gorgeous. You come in outside the tower and sit on the tree uh, and you watch them going up and down. Uh, the guy up on the left, the gray brown, does he look like anybody we know? Yeah, he's really very. What's really interesting, you can see he's actually got a red belly. <laughs> uh, so it's kind, of, it's kind of neat to see something that looks familiar. Uh, but they were, the woodpeckers were, were great. Now we, we like our woodpeckers. Well, there's a whole a bunch of birds in South and South, Central and South America that are, we know a creeper. You know what a creeper looks like? A little brown dog. Well, there's a whole bunch of creepers. We have, oh, sorry. Wrong one. I thought I had creepers next. Sorry. We'll go to trogus. These are pretty nice. Um, we had in one parking lot four different trogus. Um, and these trogus are hard to find, but once you find them, they don't move much. So you can get some really, really good pictures of them. Uh, probably Alex's favorite was the black. Oh, this was a black tail. That's the, uh, the black tail. Uh, but these are four, four of the different ones. Um, and they're just, they're spectacular. I mean, they're, they, and they just sit there once you find them. Gorgeous birds. Um, we only had two owls, but these were them, so they were pretty spectacular. The um, black and white owl was also in that um, kind of old residential area that's now kind of, uh, they're rebuilding into a resort. And we went there, the first day we went, um, Alex would be telling us, oh yeah, we're going to see the bird, we're going to see the bird. We get there, the bird's nowhere in sight. I mean, he's... Alex went there and he goes, oh, we're, you know, typical. So we went, um, I guess it was two days later, actually, that we went back. Uh, we've been up to the Discovery Center. So we'll, we'll take one more one more swing through. And sure enough, right where we were supposed to be, uh, sitting up in the, in the tree, looking down at us with the uh, lovely uh, black and white. That bird usually is much harder to find, but this was a, a really easy, we literally, you know, kind of got out of the, got off of uh, the uh, bird mobile, walked over, looked up, and we had the bird. I mean, it was, it was, it was spectacular. Uh, and these guys are, this, they're both about the size, maybe even a little bit bigger than our, our barred owl. So they're, they're a good size uh, owl. Now the uh, spectacle owl was a little bit harder to find. We had to do a little more hiking, and, and he was pretty well hidden. Um, and thanks to Bill, Actually, he's the one that spotted it up there, uh, hiding in the. Uh, nobody. That's the best best view anybody got at him. We didn't, never really got a full uh, view without anything in front of him. But uh, the spectacle owl is what it's called, and you can see why it's got those big spectacles. Uh, and it too is about the size of a, a barn owl, maybe a little bit bigger, a great barn owl, that size. So those are the only two owls we actually have. Um, the other big portion are flycatchers. And the fly, now these are these are different birds. They may look the same, but they are <laughs> different birds. There's a social. Now the great kiskadee is also in South uh, South uh, Texas and uh, Arizona and southern along our southern border. But then the social flycatcher and the um, the other one is the margin, uh, brown margin. Let's see if I can't see that. 
those three look almost identical. Um, there's another one, uh, with, well, there's, there's tropical king birds there, and then there's a lesser king, uh, lesser kiskadee as well. Uh, and they, everybody was going, okay, is that a social flight catcher? Is that this? Is that a, a, a better known than the tropical king bird is also well known as the TK. Uh, so these three were fairly common, and but you really had to look at them to figure out which ones they were. Now, on the other hand, this set, <laughs> um, most of the black edgers are kind of really weird colors, or really brown or gray, uh, or like this little guy. This is a black edger, uh, the little chubby black edger. Um, it's really sweet. We actually saw it making the nest at the Amazon uh, uh, weather. Um, <laughs> yeah, there, yeah, if you can see. Yeah, his back is, and if you see, see on the computer, it, it looks better. It gets washed out, unfortunately, with this uh, projector. Um, both the street and the Panama flycatcher were nesting right at the lodge, and they would often sit in the uh, tree right outside the, um, right off the green area by the feeding uh, station. Pretty common. And then there are some other ones. We had tarantulas, and they're open. Like I said, there's a you know, a quarter of the book is probably black edges of some kind, which we didn't get. Another spectacular types of birds that we had were the, the mot mots, and they're just fun to say, mot mot, mot mot, mot mot. Um, we had the rufus and the lesson, the broadbill, and we did have the other one, didn't we? The toady, right. Um, uh, but these are, are fairly well. These tails are just really uh, very interesting because they're long and then it looks like there's nothing there and then we have these little uh, uh, spatula kind of things. And when they, if they're making noises, you'll often see that uh, actually moving. So it's almost uh, like a little clock. Another, actually, these were, uh, let's see, the rufus, broad tail, Another one. They were all considered one species a couple of years ago and they split them. So now we have three or four or five different ones that you didn't have before. That was kind of interesting to see these. But they, if you look at the broad tail, a broad bill, and you look at the rufus, they look a whole lot alike like at first glance, but they're supposedly different. They are different. Uh, bird that we don't have, a lot of these are the honey fingers. Uh, the green honey creeper was very common at uh, the tower, and then the red legged purple honey creeper was common at the uh, lodge. Uh, and really, kind of both beautiful birds. Um, okay, so these are the <laughs> other ones the, the creepers. Um, in South, Central and South America, they're what they're what called doer birds. So there are the wood creepers, there are the leaf tossers, there are the um, so what else? They're, they do things, uh, and that's the way they, they're named. Uh, again, they look pretty much the same. These are the bigger ones that we saw. There was the cocoa, which was a lot smaller, uh, but these are you know going up and down the trees just like our, our little creeper, but they're much bigger, uh, and they're really quite uh, attractive to the eye. Problem is they're usually on a on the side of a tree tree in deep in the woods and hard to take a picture of uh, and actually get a good look at. Toucans, and I say toucan like because we did see the yellow bill toucan uh, as well as the keel bill, which is the uh, fruit loop bird. But there are other birds that are in that same family or group. Uh, one is the, uh, the collar arasari, uh, and the other one is the my favorite, actually, uh, the northern emerald chicken at the bottom. Those are the three bills and eggs. Um, okay, so there's a lot of things that say ant. There's ant pittas, there's ant shrikes, there's ant rings, there are ant this, there's ant that. Um, and probably because there are a lot of ants 
in the, in the, uh, the tropics. Um, this one in particular, uh, the amphibians are very secretive. They're brown birds. They're very difficult. We, in fact, we tried for a couple of other ones and didn't get to, didn't get to see them at all. Um, but this guy finally did come out. Uh, he coaxed them out, and I think this will work. And I don't know if you'll hear it or not. Um, yes, he was he was so sweet. Um, if you can see him. This sweet little thing. <laughs> yeah, it was so sweet. We we took I took that oh, I Danila um, took this through the this uh, through the scope. Uh, but they are they're not very big. They're probably a little smaller than a uh, robin, um, and they kind of they kind of remind you of a thrush, uh, and with the big eyes and so forth because they're on the ground and the streaky. But this guy was really really sweet. And he was he just was so nice. No. no, they're not related to the brushes. That was the question. Um, so these are just some other birds. That, you know, seems like, like I said, a couple of the other ones. The euphonia uh, is a bird that's fairly common uh, down there. Uh, and the, if you notice, there's a thick billed euphonia and there's a tawny euphonia. Funny cat euphonia, not not a whole lot of difference. The, there's a brown cap on the one. Uh, there are several other euphonias, and they all look alike. Uh, and you have to look for the very subtle, very quick um, uh, identification uh, pieces. Uh, the mannequin, uh, he wasn't doing any kind of thing. It's a little little guy. He, they're the ones that do those really weird kind of dances. Uh, now this was a breeding season, so we didn't get to see them dance. Uh, but if you if you put at uh, go to the online and you put in red cap mannequin, you'll see their dance, and it's pretty weird. And they'll make noises with their wings and, and so forth. Uh, not very big. He's only about this big. Uh, the cacique uh, is uh, a bird that we had a lot. At the, at the tower. Um, and it's related to our blackbirds. Uh, it took me a while to learn how to say it. Uh, this is one, another one of my favorite, this guy up here. Uh, it's well cuckoo. It's a good sized bird, but the tail is about. It's got to be, it's longer than, than the body of the bird, okay? And it gets its name because it literally runs along the branches like a squirrel. So it looks like a feathered squirrel. And you just keep diving around in it. And just amazing, uh, beautiful bird. Um, we, they do have some gross beaks there. Uh, that was the black uh, face gross beak. That's the only one we actually saw. And, and then again, this this picture up here, if you see it on the camera, I mean on the on the computer on the screen, uh, it doesn't do it justice. Uh, this is the nest in Ira, uh, again one of my favorite birds. Uh, he was he came and sat out off the tower, on the same picture uh, <laughs> of him looking at us. Just a, a beautiful bird. You don't think of white birds being that beautiful. And they have what are called seed eaters, uh, and they uh, are like our finches and so forth. And just some of them are really quite pretty. Uh, there's a ready uh, seed eater, ready breasted seed eater. There's a black one. Uh, and blue, blue black, blue black, blue black seed eater. Uh, or at Cedar and Eater. Here's one of those other ants. There's an ant shrike. He's pretty, um, it's funny because uh, these other, this other couple that I have went to 
was down there. They were down there in March. It was so different. Um, the uh, we Zacchaeus is another one. Um, of course, they do have uh, some uh, the little green picture there. I'm Ron Zick, and um, when the bus took everybody else off to the airport after seven glorious days of burning, it dropped up on Jan and myself in Panama City, and uh, we stayed for an extra three days. Uh, we stayed in the old town, which is circled in red here, but um, it's a historic part of Panama City. And if you think of old Charleston or old Savannah, that would give you an idea of what we were talking about. Some beautifully restored buildings right next to some old buildings that have been repainted. So um, it was a beautiful area. And uh, we really liked that the presidential palace was also down there, which meant that there were lots of military vehicles and soldiers keeping guard on the palace. So it was a very secure place to walk around if you want. The building in pink there is our hotel. Um, built in the 17th century. They didn't give an exact year, but the one next to it had a plaque on it that said 1674. The picture to the right on the bottom is our living room <coughs> area with the stained glass going out toward the balcony. Uh, we had a lot of afternoon burning in the balcony because there were small plazas all over the place. Uh, we saw birds nesting, kiskins nesting. We saw magnificent frigate birds flying over there. It was really nice. And the rooftop of the hotel was also a patio, so you could get up there and bird from up there too if they wanted to. One of our trips we wanted to see, uh, one of our excursions was to the Bio Museum in Panama City. Quite a striking building. Some of us saw it in the bus going into the town. Um, the architect that designed it is Frank Gehry, who's quite well known. Uh, sitting right on the Pacific Ocean, so it's a beautiful site also. Remarkable thing to me was there were lots of student docents helping us through the building itself, and two of them that we talked to had never been to the rainforest. It's kind of sad, but uh, we're very fortunate being Americans to be able to travel around as much as we can. Probably the main reason we wanted to extend our stay was to see the Panama Canal. Both read the book uh, at the Tennessee, so we had some idea of what, what was involved in building the canal. But as we heard Diane say, the uh, geography there was not enough conducive to ditch digging. Uh, the trip itself was quite enlightening. Um, our, our guide was tremendous. He would usually 
tell us what we're going to see first in Spanish, then in English, and then the third language may have been German or something, but we spoke five different languages. And uh, going back to uh, geography, what he did say was Jellinger cut up is, is where it was extrusive, meaning the volcanoes pushed up a salt rock, which is kind of like black glass. And it's harder than platinum or iron. So you can imagine trying to dig through that. They do a lot of blasting there. They did a lot of blasting. They still uh, have the pipes that are running down into the ground. They drop the charges down. The cleanup of the canal continues uh, with stubbed ridges there. As things collapse, they fill in uh, truckloads of salt rock going out. I think this was the names for the Sandy Mountains, Paper Roads, Grand Mountains. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that boats there, we did see. Quite a few container ships going through, but a lot of them off hold also, which I think the smaller boats are cheaper to get through, and also they can go directly to their exit hall. So, uh, if they do have a larger uh, streamlined canal, I guess, for the bigger boats. Sorry, we do see two big container ships going through. Um, final, final note, wherever we went, whether it was Atlas City or the great rainforest, it was so friendly and welcoming and helpful. Whenever we went lost in Panama City, someone would ask us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, oh, the other thing about Panama City, the old Panama City, the old town. Ron, speak up. They, they, um, they restrict the signage. So there's one point where we were, we were at the American Trading Hotel, which we were told was a huge hotel. It's, there's no signage on it whatsoever. So uh, restrict the signs. I think it's three feet by five feet and a half view. So you won't see any, you won't see any neon or plastic signs anywhere in the old town. our group. Thanks to Melissa for getting us hats from her employer. Mm -hmm. This was our last night at the lodge at dinner. So um, I'll open it up to questions either from the people on Zoom or people here. We've got a good panel here. Mosquitoes, Mosquitoes were not a problem. We were well prepared. I think a lot of us had used spray on our clothes and things like that. And we put on that. But uh, I got more mosquitoes the first day I was back in yeah. Charlotte. <laughs> and then it's outside. It was also right. about 15 degrees cooler there than it was in Charlotte during that day, too. It was, you know, it was running close to 100 here in Charlotte. And we were running in the low 80s. But it was humid. But it was humid here. That's right. In the evenings, it would cool off. And even a little bit more in the lodge because of the elevation, it was uh, really quite comfortable. We had ceiling fans and stuff. Yeah. We uh, we had good Wi-Fi. And I don't know, I, I think I had a cell phone there, but I never really used it. Yes. Yes. If they had good cell phone. Okay, cell phone. I think there was. We, uh, the tower was better than the box. The tower was better than the box. Yeah. And the first Yeah. We had Wi Fi, and Wi Fi varied. Kind of spread out, but there was cell coverage, but that varied some too because of the topography of things. Yeah, 
Google Lens for identifying things, and I don't know who's really doing that. I mean, our guides. Our guides mean pretty much yeah. almost yeah. anybody. The guides. That was the amazing thing. But they were really good with the with the, with the flora and the insects yeah. and everything else that was there. They really. Stuff. Like the toady mod mod. Way back there. With branches everywhere. It's like, you're looking at it, and though, if this Google position, come look at this. And there it is. It's like unbelievable. And how they do this, and it was dark, you know, it's, it's, you know, especially in the green season, everything is really blue and dark. They're all really, they're all considered what we would consider hummingbirds. Yes, but they're, but they just don't, they're not all called hummingbirds. Yes, they're all in that same thing. Right. Yeah, the blue throat, the, uh, the croquette was a new, um, yeah, blue throat, a blue chested, not blue chested, or like you want to call it, it's a blue chested, um, yeah, I would say half of them probably. Those were really pretty and they were very plentiful around the uh, tower. Yeah. The coquette was kind of hard to see because we, we actually went by a couple of times. Yeah, right. To see that in that particular day, it was a real bland looking sky. And it was a teeny little thing that was on top of it. Like it got close. Snowy belly, though. Snowy belly was very cooperative. Yeah, he was very cooperative. Yeah. We were four nights in both places. Transportation was great. They picked us up here for it. They transported us between the two. Transported us back to here. Yes, both guys did. And one day we had uh, we had another guy. Yeah. No. Neil is the youngest guy, I think, but he's about 30. So. But I tell you what, he's oh. very personal, very accommodating. And you can, you know, we went down as a group, but you can actually go down and be a, uh, like this, this other couple on there that went down in March, and they have kind of a routine. That they'll go, they have whoever is in the tower, they'll take to you know the, the different spots. They have a, a regular routine spots. We went to uh, the tower, we went to all of them, I guess. We had all the different places that they would normally stay with the, the uh, you know, go out once in, they go out in the morning, we go to one spot, we come back for lunch, and then we go back out in the afternoon and a couple of siesta to go back late in mid afternoon about three o'clock and go out at six, come back to dinner. Um, and you know, they have kind of a, a set pattern. If you're there and like we had a group, we had some other people come in, they'll get an, another guide for you and, and take you out. So you don't have to be with a group. You can, you know, you go down, you know, a couple of them by yourself. You could you could actually stay in fact a couple of years. So we went back from uh, from Madrid. Madrid was yeah. by, there by himself, and then the two women from. Um, there was another guy there too. Yeah, uh, the very first day yeah, he was a, day. a filmmaker. So they, they kind of people kind of it is a lodge that comes go and they, they people can get out. So you can just make a reservation at the lodge in the tower. That made friends with the guy from Madrid. Yeah. yeah. Communicating by by email was that he was. Studying uh, Latin American literature, and he teaches that at the University of Madrid. And he uh, used 
fact that some of the stories you know, mentions a bird in it is an excuse to spend two days at the town. <laughs> Yeah. Are there any other questions? Any questions from uh, from the Zoom? Let me see if there's any. No questions. Okay. One of the people on the trip is on Zoom. Eleanor O'Neill is there. So hi, Eleanor. Yeah, yeah, that's her up there. Hi, Charlene. Aren't you? Charlene. Yeah. Uh, I don't think she made it. Oops. Oh, sharing. No. It was amazing how we dodged it though, because our, our days we started it, you know, we go up to the top of the tower, we go out somewhere before breakfast like you know usually it's 6 a.m it might be raining all night we get up and well, so we, get to we go to breakfast it would rain again a little bit and then we go out at you know eight o'clock and we stop and then we get back at noon and have uh you know, lunch at 12 30 and have a siesta and a rain during siesta and then we go back out and stop <laughs> then we get back for dinner <laughs> it would start up again it was every day after day even the last day we went to a local market yeah. And it was raining like crazy just before just we left. Pouring. We got in the van, it was just pouring rain. We got to the market, it was pouring rain, and we got ready to leave the market. So. <laughs> yeah. Thanks everyone for coming out. I thought that was one more thing I was supposed to say. But I can't oh, yes. Where should our next international trip be? Panama. <laughs> Panama. They've got a third location called the Canopy Camp, and that's where you go to find the Harpy Eagle. That may be what we do. Okay, yeah. thanks all. Good night. Okay.